and now there are uh, four of us. So welcome, Ryan. Thank you all for joining. Um, we're going to get going right away. Today I'm going to, or this afternoon, I'm going to give the second half of the uh, of a, the lecture of a lecture on uh, sociological theories as these are generally understood in introduction to sociology. Um, a little bit more narrowly, or in order to focus my in, a, in order to focus our attention on what you're expected to be able to do with um, the information in this lecture. It's focused, on, I, I've got at the back of my mind, your ability to complete assignment one that I just posted, that I just posted this morning, uh, and which I invite you, I urge you actually to later, once this is done, go and take a look at it. Uh, later today, I'm going to record a brief, hopefully brief, uh, video completely asynchronous, so with no student participation, that will um, explain in more detail, I hope, uh, what assignment one requires of you. Um, but first, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this lecture. So to get there, I'm going to now open my. Um, the PowerPoint that I prepared. Okay, so there's a bunch of us. So in this afternoon's lecture, I'm going to discuss the second of the two theoretical frameworks that you'll be asked that you've been asked to discuss in assignment one, uh, sociological theory and COVID. And that uh, that theoretical framework that I'm going to discuss and describe in a few minutes is in most sociology textbooks identified by the label conflict theory. Um, but for a, a number of reasons that I don't think are especially compelling sociological uh, reasons, uh, or, or, I mean, sorry, let me start over. I think that label is unsatisfactory, and the label that's assigned to this theory strikes me as a more accurate uh, theory uh, that's assigned in, in the reading that I've given you for the assignment, and that label is neo-Marxism. Uh, I suspect that the history of, um, well, the history of Marxism in North America uh, has something to do with the decision by sociologists to give to this theory the name conflict theory rather than uh, putting the label of Marxism or neo-Marxism on it, but that's a separate, largely separate issue. For our purposes, uh, what I'm explaining today is uh, what is described in that uh, that reading on sociological theory that I've given you, and it maps on very well to the content of, the, of our textbook and to most intro textbooks. So sociological theory, conflict theory. So these are the topics I'm going to try to hit today in explaining what conflict theory, uh, how conflict theory approaches the issues of sociology in sociology. Now, it's important to understand that all sociologists believe about themselves and about what it is that they're trying to do. They're all trying to describe the same world, the only world there is, the world that we live in. It is just not the case that there is a structural functionalist world or a conflict theory world or a conflict theory society or anything along those lines. Sociologists all agree that we live in the only world that there is and we're all trying to describe the same world. We just have different theoretical approaches that we apply in trying to uh, make sense of the world, explain the world, 
and describe the phenomena we encounter. So with that uh, point made, I, these are the topics I want to talk about. The materialist perspective, social change, ideology, the state, and finally conflict and contradiction. So uh, among the more widely cited passages from an early book that Marx and Engels wrote, but never published. This is from a book that was only published in the 1930s, uh, 50 or 60 years after Marx died, uh, called The German Ideology. And the quote says, men can, be, men can be distinguished from animals by consciousness, by religion, or anything else you like. They themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence a step which is conditioned by their physical organization. By producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual material life. And so the, 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 the point, the, the, the reason to invoke that, uh, that passage is, the, the Marx and Engels' reason to invoke that passage is, they're trying to provide as neutral a basis for their theory of society as they have available to them. And whatever else is going on, their claim is, uh, humans in what they produce, when humans produce something, they're not only producing something outside of themselves, they're producing along with that the material that they're going to eat that they need in order to survive and reproduce. And so in a very real physical uh, sense, a great deal of human production ends up becoming part of human life. So I mean, the, the, the connection here is that you are what you eat. Now, uh, Marx makes the point uh, that initially, as far as we know, and we now know in 2021, we know a lot more than what people knew in the 1840s when Marx and Engels wrote the German ideology about what conditions were like before, um, before we have very much evidence, so in so-called hunter-gatherer societies. But although we know more, than was known in Marx's day, we still really don't know that much about what was going on in uh, how human societies were organized prior to uh, the prior to writing. Basically, it's it's with the uh, practice of writing that we begin to have enough evidence to reconstruct, in some minimally plausible way, what human life was like. Prior to that, it's basically guesswork. But we don't have to make blind guesses. And in uh, another unpublished writing that was made available in the, this one in the 1950s, Marx develops the speculation uh, that seems, at least to me, uh, to a number of other people, reasonable enough that even when humans uh, didn't farm, even when humans provided for themselves simply through collecting food as it was available, so uh, either chasing animals down or even a little bit less immediately obvious in connection to the quote, when they just harvested fruits and nuts from the ground, it's still required of them to actively go and get that stuff and put it in themselves. We had to, in that way, produce the means of subsistence by getting up, going to the tree, taking the apple from the tree, going over to the bush, grabbing the berries from the bush or whatever was being eaten. And in that way, when men produce, when people here, Marx and Engels use the word man largely uh, 
to indicate humans, not gender, not not necessarily, not automatically in a gendered way. Although they, Marx and Engels themselves, were both uh, absolutely um, marked by the uh, deeply held sexist views of their day. Still. I'm trying to describe what they had to say and the intention here. So humans produce their own actual material conditions. And so Marx and Engels are going to claim that everything that humans do is part of that effort and part of that uh, act of producing their own material lives, including they, they're going to claim and this is the basis of the conflict perspective, including all the social relations we enter into. So the materialist perspective is meant to understand uh, that it is consistent with and is, is the basis for the claim that the values that we in 2021, whatever those values turn out to be, the, the values by which we organize our lives and orient ourselves in our relationships to each other and to nature, all of these are produced by humans through the act of producing the conditions that are required for survival on our planet. So that's what the material perspective is. Now, Now, um, to a great extent, what Marx and Engels were most interested in understanding as social theorists was to understand how is it that European society, the society in which they lived and about which they had the most uh, information, the deep, deep transformations that had gone on in European society over the 50 or so years uh, before, they're, they're, before they were born. So in order to orient ourselves a little bit to what Marx and Engels were writing about, it's, well, I'm going to have to do, we're going to have to do a little bit of history. So um, Marx and Engels were Germans. They were, uh, yeah, they were, let's just say they were Germans. Germany wasn't yet a country. It was really uh, an amalgamation of a bunch of principalities and, and city-states and so on. Um, but they grew up and li they lived and grew up in, in what we today call Germany. And Germany was undergoing dramatic changes. Good afternoon, John. No worries. Um, I hope you got my email, uh, John. So. Um, they were interested in understanding social change. So over the course of their lifetime, Germany was transformed from a largely feudal society into a uh, industrial society. And so uh, a number of crucial, their, their society and European society more broadly underwent a number of dramatic transformations, mainly uh, on the basis of a new mode of production. The Industrial Revolution was underway in England at the time, and over the course of Marx and Engels's lifetime, German production was um, dramatically transformed from local scale artisan kind of production to mass industrialization. Uh, the application of all of the new 19th century technologies increased human productivity to a great, to, a, to an enormous extent. In England, and then a little bit later in France, associated with, but from a conceptual point of view, problematically related to these transformations in how the economy was organized, 
So England and France also underwent this industrial revolution. What happened in the political sphere was that the landed nobility, that is the aristocracy, which for a thousand years had been in charge of English society and of French society and of German society, was displaced to a very great degree and they were replaced so that the aristocratic landed nobility lost its effective control over society and its place of predominance. And they were replaced by what Marx and Engels called the bourgeoisie. But what they meant by the bourgeoisie was the owners of the means of production. A hundred years before Marx and Engels lived, the ruling class ruled on the basis of their control over land. It was the dukes and the princes and the kings and the counts that held effective social power. But in that hundred year period from 1750 to 1850, for a number of reasons, Marx and Engels argued that it was in the final instance in, in the, 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 the bottom line was it was changes in the economic mode of production that dictated the changes in the other aspects of society. The political changes from uh, a monarchy to a democracy and the social changes in terms of uh, human interaction, all of these were dictated by economic changes. Everybody in Surely everybody in Marx's and Engels' lifetime agreed that their society underwent dramatic changes. Many, many people uh, felt threatened by these changes. Many, many people did not like these changes. Many people thought these changes were bad. But nobody disagreed that society was being radically, dramatically transformed. And so the emphasis on social change in conflict theory is a crucial emphasis. And it's especially important for our purposes because in many ways it's the flip side of the focus of the other theory that I described earlier and that you'll find an account of uh, on Blackboard under the recorded lectures in the recorded lectures folder. Structural functionalism, the main competing framework is organized around trying to explain the, the relative stability of society. So structural functionalism starts from the assumption that societies are essentially stable human organizations with mechanisms built into them to return stability whenever the equilibrium is um, threatened or, or, or challenged or, or disturbed. Whereas Marx and Engels' starting point is that human societies have been characterized from the very beginning by important periods of social change. Okay, so now the next component from the lecture or from the reading is um, has to do with ideology and in particular the dominant ideology and how it operates hegemonically. So another uh, quote from that same book, the, the German ideology, uh, a widely reproduced quote Marx and Engels wrote, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. That is, the class, which is the ruling material force of society, is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. The class which has the means of material production at its disposal, has control at the same time over the means of mental production. When I was trying to describe, when I was describing a little bit the materialist approach, mainly what Marx and Engels were trying to hammer home to people, I mean, it's obvious that uh, laptops, for example, or um, uh, the telegraph, to pick an example from their lifetime, were material objects that were human, that were produced by humans. What's a little bit more difficult to get our arms around to, to 
to, to, to be a little bit clearer about are the ideas that we have. How do ideas come about? Marx and Engels insisted, and what they meant by the materialist perspective was that even our ideas have to be understood as the result of human activity in the world. And so that any ideas that we have, they must have come from humans. Where else could they come from? Uh, yeah, so uh, human thinking, human ideas, human relationships, all of these according to Marx and Engels and, and, and according to conflict theory, all of these are ultimately the result of human effort. Human society has been characterized, according again to Marx and Engels, and uh, in that respect, their ideas continue to be influential in sociology to the degree that many sociologists are uh, struck by how important a role conflict plays in uh, organizing but both actual conflict and the efforts that are made to defuse conflict, to resist conflict, to resolve conflict. So a great deal of effort is devoted in contemporary society to avoid conflict and resolve conflict. Well, that's what Marx and Engels and conflict theorists since then mean when they say that social change is really the, uh, the permanent force in human society rather than stability, as opposed to stability, which is the central argument that structural functionalists rely on. Now, these ideas, they don't just come from anywhere, and they don't just fulfill any old role, according to conflict theorists. Because of the advantages that those people in any given society who have managed to seize control over the production of the necessities of life in any given society, in order to maintain that control, one of the strategies that they always adopt is to produce ideas that make the maintenance of their control over that society easier, more efficient, more guaranteed. And it's turned out, when we take a look at history, uh, that one of the ways of doing that is to convince the mass of the people that the minority of people in charge deserve to be in charge, that they should be in charge, that they're ruling on our behalf. And so Marx and Engels uh, took a look at historical societies from around the world uh, in their time and earlier, and they, they were able to demonstrate to the satisfaction of some people anyway, that in many, many cases, it was clear that religious ideas and philosophical ideas under all circumstances always end up reinforcing the legitimacy of whichever class rules in any particular society. If we take a look, for example, at Canada in the, at the beginning of the 20th century, we see that the ruling a class in Canada were predominantly Christians. And we see a connection between the Christian church, the Catholic church in Quebec, and to an important degree in Ontario, uh, and the Protestant church more significantly in Ontario and in the other provinces other than Quebec. They managed to, between themselves, share power and rely on each other in order to organize the rest of human society, the rest of Canadian society, in such a way as to ensure the continued advantage of the ruling class, and the evidence evidence of that, and evidence of how it works to the advantage of some and to the dramatic disadvantage of others, 
was made available to us a couple of weeks ago with the revelation of those 215 bodies buried outside that residential school that was run by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church operated successfully by convincing people through ideas that society was being organized in the way that was best for everybody and the way they described that, the part of their of their ability to convince people of that was by convincing them that, that this is what God wants. And so religion, according to Marx and Engels, according to conflict theorists, religion in most cases is a tool that is designed unconscious, largely unconsciously by ruling classes as a mechanism that they can use to maintain their power over the rest of society. Now what they mean by dominant ideology, it's clear in the 21st century that there's uh, a great deal of disagreement among people about all kinds of different things. And if we just take a casual look at um, all kinds of cultural production, the internet, Facebook, Twitter, and all that, it seems like all we have is disagreement. But that, in fact, seeming disagreement covers over what is really an astonishing consensus over virtually all of the important aspects of contemporary society. Although there's an enormous amount of disagreement around all kinds of cultural things, th this is the conflict theory point that I'm describing. Although there's a great deal of disagreement about many as cultural aspects of our society, the dominant ideology successfully has convinced most Canadians, most Americans, most people around the world that the fundamental organization of society in Canada, in the United States, is the most rational, the most just, and the uh, the most efficient organization, namely the, organi the, the, uh, the organization of control over the means of production by the people who own those means of production. Society is controlled by and therefore for the benefit of the people who own the means of production. Over the last four or five days, CNN has been running this special. I didn't watch it. I think CNN, anyway, I didn't watch it, but I saw the headlines. And they, the, the headline or the tagline of the show was that Jeff Bezos and um, who's the other guy? Elon Musk, although in the last year since COVID happened, their fortunes have increased astonishingly. So Jeff Bezos is worth now something like $150 billion. He's paid virtually no income tax in the last two years. And that will be an example of how uh, the dominant ideology successfully, and, and so, yeah, so Jeff Bezos, although he's massively wealthy, he nonetheless doesn't have to contribute his own money to the organization of society. That's clearly an instance where the organization of society is done for the benefit of the people who own it, as opposed to the benefit who do the work. So Jeff Bezos. $50 billion, and the people who work in his factories don't even have enough money to pay for their own food and rent. He gets all the profit, and they do all the work. There's a contradiction there. And the conflict theory point, the important sociological point about this is that, oh, here's the train, so I'm going to have to wait a second.
Marx and Engels observed and contemporary sociologists, many contemporary sociologists agree that it turns out to be much more efficient, much less expensive to convince people to do something than it is to have to force them to do it. And so ideology, and in particular the dominant ideology, can be seen as a tool that makes the rule of the ruling class much more efficient than the available alternatives are. And when social change occurs, especially rapid social change, it's when there's a breakdown in the consensus that had been achieved by an earlier generation's uh, ideological formations. And so what we have is uh, we have a new generation, you, your generation, are you're inheriting an economy. Sorry, let me just see that, that looked interesting. Stephen says, what's sad is that workers being exploited by Bezos and other CEOs are often convinced to blame people. It's sad, and that's another aspect of uh, the dominant ideology and the way ideology operates. Uh, it turns out that, rab that, that ideas are developed and supported and sustained. Yeah, exactly. P -p people receiving. So many working class people have been fooled by the ruling class into resenting more. They're, they're more resentful of a few people managing to get a little bit of extra money from the government than they are uh, angry about Jeff Bezos getting to keep his $150 billion. It seems to them more of an outrage, more of an injustice that other people like them are getting a small advantage than the people who really don't like us, Jeff Bezos and, and, and Elon Musk that they get these enormous advantages. And so that it, it, this is what um, the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci was trying to describe with the notion of hegemony. Ruling classes, successful ruling classes, develop networks of ideas and uh, attitudes that the rest of us internalize that convince us to be satisfied with the conditions under which we live and to overlook the existing contradictions that remain uh, when we analyze carefully enough these ideas. Now another aspect, let me just get back to my slides so I stay on track. So now the next important um, consideration to introduce the way uh, conflict theory operates has to do with how to understand, I, might, I think I made a spelling mistake, it, there should be two L's in Miliband. Uh, what is the role of government in, uh, in all of this? And so uh, another aspect of conflict theory and more broadly, another aspect of sociology that it's important to understand uh, is that our contemporary understanding of what the government is and what it does uh, is a modern one. The, 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 our, our form of government, although it has historical connections to earlier societies, the scale of it is uh, a brand new thing. Even if, if we go back even 150 years, the state had far, far, far less to do with the majority of the aspects of, of humans' lives compared to today. In 2021, if you're born in 2021 in Toronto, for example, uh, the state from before you're born has connections to an impact on and uh, requirements of your biological parents. 
uh, your, your parents behavior is constrained by laws that are imposed and, and, and governed and regulated and enforced by the state your parents attitudes are shaped to a great degree by information generated by the state there's other sources of information as well but the government has a strong mandate and invests a lot a lot of money into um and in many ways for good for the for for, for to the advantage of the, the, the society but Nonetheless, it is doing things and involved in things that 150 years ago were private matters or or maybe just community matters, but they weren't government matters. In the 21st century, there's almost no part of our lives that the government doesn't have some kind of connection to or control of. And so the state emerges as a, an extraordinarily important social factor, social force. And that transformation of human society, uh, earlier societies, government didn't play such a large role. But over time, as the economy becomes more and more complex, as production increases and as human productivity increases dramatically, the extent to which human activity has to be coordinated in order to produce all of the things that are required to keep individual humans alive and also to keep separate societies functioning as those societies, all of these require increased intervention in and increased coordination among the different aspects of people's lives. Sociology is one of those interventions. Sociology emerges as the university, the research university is developed partly as a response by the state to the increased demands that are placed on the state. The two categories of experts that are most widely employed in the state by the government since, say, the Industrial Revolution are social scientists and lawyers. And both of those, um, both of those areas, I mean, there's lots of other specialties, but those are the two most widely kind of skill sets and educational backgrounds that form the bulk of the people who uh, organize, regulate, formulate, reform, change, amend the regulations that constitute state activity. And it's not a coincidence, at least not according to conflict theorists, that these increased demands on the state occur, or as these increased demands on the state occur, one of the responses of societies was to increase and develop and change the university as an institution. The contemporary, the modern university evolved from the medieval university. The medieval university was primarily an institution set up to train religious functionaries, to train priests and bishops. As the Industrial Revolution happened, there was an increased demand for engineers, for scientists, and for accountants, and for lawyers, and later for uh, organizational specialists, social scientists trained in uh, managing complex human systems. And so as the uh, demands on the state are transformed, the society responds by organizing new institutions to fulfill those demands and one of the goals of those institutions is to manage social change. One of the key, and according to Marx and Engels, the key social transformation that allowed for the, 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 the 
that made it possible to transform European economy from an agricultural feudal economy to an industrial capitalist economy was to transform agricultural land-based workers into landless wage workers who sell their labor to the owners of the means of production. And that required reorienting their own self-understanding of their relationship to the land, their relationship to each other, and their relationship to society. Religion, religious institutions adapted to those changes, and the state adapted to those changes. And so the third transformation that I want to call to your attention that is at the heart of the conflict theory approach is around how education systems adapted to this. I mentioned that the university, uh, the university was transformed from the medieval institution that supplied religious functionaries to the uh, modern institution that supplies the technical specialists required for the operation of the modern economy and the modern state. But in addition to that, what was required was an educational system to uh, free up workers' time. So the educational system was meant to give a place for kids to go to during the day so that working class men and women could participate in the wage economy. And as a bonus, it allows for the transformation of the sons and daughters of farmers who are basically useless for a capitalist economy to transform them into future workers, future participants in the wage labor economy. And they do that by in inculcating into them in the, the, the values and the orientations and so not just the skills, not just the knowledge that is acquired in education, but also the interpersonal relationships, the habit of being on time, the habit of deferring to your social to, to the people who are placed above you in the hierarchy. All, none of these are natural, spontaneous human responses. All of these are learned behaviors on which the, 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 the smooth functioning of society depends. Uh, I'm afraid I won't have time to go into the miliband Poulansas debate. That was a debate among conflict theorists in the 1970s and 1980s, um, but maybe I'll come to that later. Okay later in the course. So now the, the, the last topic I want to discuss is um, the relationship between conflicts and contradiction as these are understood by um, conflict theorists. Um, In addition to being a materialist theory of society, conflict, theorists, conflict theory uh, in most of its versions is a deeply historical account, a deeply historical theory. And conflict theory takes seriously the fact that our society today is, has developed out of earlier societies. And we've had to, we, we, we continue to learn most of the lessons. So you continue to learn most of the lessons that my generation learned. But along the way, you are unlearning the lessons that we as a society have come to, to believe my generation either misunderstood or no longer needs. And so there are these incremental changes over time that are adaptations to new circumstances. When I went to uh, high school, people, some people still learned Latin and Greek. That's large, almost completely gone now. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely on its way out even when I started high school. Um, as an example, I'm exactly old enough that when I did 
physics in grade 10, uh, we learned how to use a slide rule because calculators were so expensive that even in the middle, upper middle class neighborhood I grew up in, not everybody had a calculator. And so we used slide rules and we had to learn how to use a slide rule in order to be able to do the math for physics and chemistry in the high school science curriculum. Well, count, uh, slide rules, I'm sure, are still terrific things, but nobody, I mean, I, I, do any of you even know what a slide rule is? No, oh, how about that? Uh, I bet many of you don't know what a slide rule is, and I'd be really surprised if any of you knew how to use a slide rule. Now, everyone, all, many, many people have a phone. If you go, you can go to a grocery store and you can get a calculator for three dollars. For fifteen dollars, you can get a calculator that can do absolutely, uh, you know, high-level mathematical stuff. Most of what you'd need to be able to get through an undergraduate degree uh, in biology and physics, even for for you know for only fifteen dollars. So it would be pointless now to uh and we're slowly adapting to this we're our math curriculum yeah it, it it allows you to do very very quickly a slide rule allows you to do um a, multiplications and divisions to do trigonometry it allows you to do a lot of what a calculator can allow you to do uh but my main point was that technological changes have meant that we uh, no longer need to know some of the skills we used to need to know, but also that we need to acquire certain skills. And so uh, I don't. whenever I run into trouble with my computer, I was going to say my stupid computer, it's whenever stupid me runs into trouble with my smart computer, Usually, I just have to call my son or my daughter to get them to help me because I'm just not familiar with it. They grew up with these tools. I did not. So your generation, in many ways, has adapted to these new conditions more easily than my mine has. But some of this, so these are just minor adaptations, advantages. More or less, everyone is, is gaining by this. But some of these changes are dramatic changes. And Marx and Engels, as I mentioned, grew up in the middle of the, of the 19th century. And in particular, they grew up following the French Revolution. And the French Revolution is widely seen by, even, by, by most historians today to be uh, a very important change point in global history. The, France was one of at least one of the most powerful societies, countries, kingdoms in the world at the end of the 18th century. But in 1789, uh, the working class in Paris fed up with uh, the starvation and all of the conflict that was going on in their society, organized themselves, and in concert with, in cooperation and coordination with the, the middle class, the, the ownership class, the shopkeepers of Paris, they managed to overthrow the French government. And eventually, they uh, arrested the king, they executed the king, and they instituted a, from our point of view, semi-democratic government. And by chopping the king's head off, they made it clear that there were other ways of organizing human society other than through a monarchy, other than through this illusion that God organized societies in such a way that the arist aristocrats would rule society forever. Society managed to reorganize itself. And part of what drove that conflict to revolution was the incompatibility between what it was that French society under the monarchy announced itself as, the values they claimed to uphold, and the results that they were getting. A wide enough appreci appreciation to the June Rebellion of which year?
Sophia asked about the June rebellion. Uh, which June rebellion? And do you mean in France? So yeah, in in France it was July 16th that the sans culottes they were they call they were called sans culottes. Uh, that's the sort of the working class kind of the working class in Paris attacked um, a castle in Paris, the Bastille, and they captured the Bastille, believing that there were prisoners and weapons in there. They were a bit mis misinformed, uh, but the French Revolution typically is kicked is is seen as having been kicked off by the capture of the Bastille on the 16th of July in Paris. Uh, and that disagreement, that conflict led eventually led to the king having to abdicate his throne and then he was eventually tried by a, an assembly of notables who found him guilty of crimes against the nation and so he was executed for those crimes. And what conflict theorists were claiming, the lesson that French society drew from that was that when values fail to achieve what they say they're trying to achieve, a level of instability arises in that society such that the, the existing contradictions make that make it impossible for that society to continue to operate. Uh, last January 6th in Washington, D.C., uh, hundreds and hundreds of people forced their way into uh, the Capitol in Washington, D.C., and they uh, it looks like and many of them, it's clear that they attempted to prevent Congress from certifying the results of the 2020 November, excuse me, presidential election. And what that reflects, according one version of this, according to conflict theorists, what that reflects is uh, a contradiction between the, the understanding of democracy among the population in the United States. And the real, the concern was, and the reason that it was identified by many people as an insurrection, was that in the United States, for over 200 years, for almost 250 years, every four years, except during this, the period of the Civil War from 1861 to 1865, the United States had an election every four years, and they and power was transferred from one government to the next, often the same party, but also often from different parties proposing different kinds of policies. Power was peacefully transferred from one government to the next. And that peaceful transfer of power seemed to have been and seems to have been almost successfully threatened. These contradictions generated a, con a, a conflict that almost prevented the smooth operation of uh, U U.S. society. And in the past, that has sometimes led to a dramatic reorganizing of society. In France, in the 1780s and 1790s, after the king was executed, the government that formed made it illegal to be a noble. And France had been organized for a thousand years on the basis of the, the hereditary transfer of power along family lines. And that hereditary transfer of power meant transferring fortunes, transferring financial wealth from one generation to the next, and transferring political power from one generation to the next. The French Revolution broke that political generational connection. Power was no longer, political power no longer was going to be transferred from one generation to the next solely through inheritance. It was made illegal, it was made against the law to be a member of the nobility. 
Noble titles were abolished. And everybody who owned a certain amount of property was deemed to be a full citizen of the French Republic. And all of them were to be equal before the law. And that was the result of this conflict that was generated by contradictions in French society. And that is how, according to conflict theorists, this is how dramatic changes in human organization have occurred throughout human history. Now, the chapter that I've assigned for the assignment ends on a, a paragraph that says there are there's a similarity and there's a difference between the two main theories. The main similarity is these are structural functionalism and conflict theory are both macro level theories. And, uh, there's a typo here that should say neo-Marxist, not neo-Marxist. But the big essential difference between the two theories is uh, appears in the question, in whose interests do the structures, do the institutions of a society operate? Structural functionalists argue that it's society overall, it's the interests of society overall that govern, that dictate how the different institutions coordinate and adapt to changing circumstances. In contrast to that view, neo-Marxists, conflict theorists argue that by and large, the adaptations of existing institutions are made to further the interests of the dominant class in that society, even when they come at the expense of the majority of the rest of that society. So uh, I've run out of time, uh, but I've also gone, gotten to the end of my slides, so that's pretty good. Uh, later today, I'm going to post a 30-minute uh, a or so of video where I will uh, explain the assignment, the assignment, the, the sociological theory assignment. I will describe briefly uh, the two articles that it's based on, and uh, I will demonstrate by looking at the, the texts of those two articles uh, how it is I'm, I'm asking, what it is I'm asking you to do. So I'll post that. Uh, later today, or or perhaps tomorrow morning. Anyway, uh, I'm going to turn.